But you guys impressed me. However, my unique opportunity is so great, it's so freaking awesome, that I'm really gonna need you both to work for it. There you go, everybody. How right Well, we've got Lucha Underground to talk about here. The crowning of a champion in an Aztec warfare match. Complete, I might add, with an Aztec warfare ceremony. Yes. This That's what made this whole thing great. Automatically, from the get-go, was phenomenal. It was very easy, too. It's Aztec Warfare. They've been building to it. I guess they just announced on the last show, but they've had almost a month now to, to build to this. And uh, they go to, what do they call it? it has, the, the arena has a name. I forgot. I forgot. They go to their arena. and The they dump? Have... <laughs> I don't think it's called the dump. I don't think so, no. But uh, they had Aztec drummers and dancers in full ceremonial garb surrounding the ring. Scattered throughout the arena up in the upper levels. This is a big deal. They made this special from the get-go. It was awesome. And then it was even better. Because we have all seen, you know, this was a Royal Rumble. We have all seen the big clock. They did have a clock here. But it just counts down, counts down to 10 like everything else you've ever seen. But uh, this was Aztec warfare. So when the clock started to count down, they didn't like play a ticking sound or anything or a buzzer. The temple. The temple. Thank you. The uh, did not have a ticking sound or a buzzer or any of that stuff. No. When the clock began to tick down, the drums began. That's right. The drums of war. And a new combatant entered the battlefield. Yes. This is so awesome. Every time. It never got old. Nope. And when the last guy entered, they played the drums for a dramatic 30 seconds as the final round began. Yes. Yes. So... Dario Cueto opened the uh, show in the ring, got a very quick promo saying this, I basically taking credit for the match itself. He invented the Battle Royal. Yeah. The, he uh, explained it would be two men in the ring, one man in there every 90 seconds, eliminations via pinfall or submission, no count out, no DQs. It would be ridiculous to eliminate someone for going over the top rope since men were going to be going over the top rope throughout the match for 45 minutes. Lucha with uh, top rope eliminations would be boring. That's right. It'd be very boring. So Phoenix was number one. He had lost the match to set that up in the uh, last show. And then number two, by random draw, Dario Cueto was sure to emphasize, was one of his arch enemies, Johnny Mundo. It's funny because Dario Cueto is a heel. But when he did, and of course the announcement that Johnny Mundo was number two was supposed to hammer that home, but... When he is there introducing the Aztec Warfare match, and he's got all the guys out there, and he's holding up the big gold belt, everybody is cheering him like a baby face and chanting Aztec Warfare. Yes. Show rules. It is awesome. It's the best show on television, as we'll get into here. So Phoenix and uh, Mundo had a great flurry of action for 90 seconds, and then the drum beats began for the next entrant, and that's when I realized how much fun this whole hour is going to be. And it turns out that the 20 men in this, uh, this here Aztec warfare, probably a third of them, I had no idea who they were. I think we'd seen most of them. Yep. Number three was Mr. Cisco, who was one of Big Rick's flunkies. And I learned on this show that Big Rick's flunkies are called The Crew. The Crew yeah. sucks, <laughs> as not... we found out in this show, as they were all eliminated in rapid fashion. Well, that's the point. They're, they're flunkies. They're, yes. They're, they're cannon fodder. They are the guys. You ever watch? You, you ever watch the old Adam West Batman show? Oh yeah. The Joker almost never fought Batman. He had three or four thugs who would fight Batman and get their asses kicked every time. Exactly because you know what? In real life, there's always a hierarchy. Yes. It's not a mid card where everybody is on the exact same level. Yes. And they all have to win and lose the same number of matches. Yes. It's okay that Big Rick almost never loses, and his flunkies are complete jobbers. Yes, his flunkies are stormtroopers. They're there to absorb bullets and die. So, Mr. Cisco got beat quickly. 
And he was eliminated before the next man came in. The other great thing about this show, we have talked about how they make no illusion of pretending to be a live sporting event. So every other wrestling match you've ever seen, when they go to a commercial in the middle of the match, they always say, you know, it used to be, if the match ends during the break, we will show you the finish. That's right. And they come back now and they don't even tease that, but they do say, look at what you missed during the break. Because this show does not have the pretense of being live, like a guy would come out to be number four, they would go to commercial, they would air three minutes of commercials or whatever, and when they came back, number four had not gotten in the ring yet. Yep. It came back at the exact point in time that they had stopped on. It is not a sporting event. It is a television show about a sporting event. Yes. That's why you never even see what there's never been one replay. You know how many awesome spots I have seen on this show and I've had to rewind because the way the show is produced, they don't ever show a replay because it would make no sense in the context of the way the show is produced. Yes. It is a show It is like Field of Dreams, a movie about baseball. But you're not going to see, it's not a, it's not a, you know what I mean? Everyone knows what I mean, for fuck's sake. But the point of it is, that's what makes this work. The the internal logic is consistent throughout the show and the season. That's the problem TNA has always had. They can't figure out what they want to do, and so they mix it up and it pulls you out of the show. They never pull you out of the show in Lucha Underground. That's right. So, right before the break, King Cuerno was number four. I should take it back. He came out after the break. That, that, that showed up later. So, King Cuerno was number four. He wiped out everyone, hit a big tope. And then he, he ends up on the floor. And Phoenix goes to the top rope. He walks the tightrope like the flying Walendas. And there's a giant moonsault off the top rope onto uh, Cuerno. The Flying Willendez? What the hell are their names? Those, those acrobats. The Traveling Wilburys? No, that's a band. Anyway. Yeah, Flying Willendez. Hmm. Got that right. How about that? A circus act and daredevil stunt performers. Known for high wire acts without a safety net. So, Son of Havoc was number five. Johnny Mundo worked his beard over. And number six was Pippinella Escarlata. Oh, man. Pimpy is amazing. It's a good thing he's charismatic. Horrible, but hilarious. Yes. He threw the lowest drop kick that I have ever seen, and, and that includes Vinny. This is not a drop kick to the knee, mind you. No. <laughs> he's no. aiming for the head and torso area. Another thing I noticed is, facially, Pimpy looks very much like Antonio Bigfoot Silva, which once yeah, you see yeah, it, yes, you I, will never be able to unsee. I, I can see that, actually. Yeah. Prince Puma was number seven. Have we mentioned that Stryker fucked up and called it Wrestling Kingdom instead of Wrestle Kingdom? Somewhere in here, yes. Yeah. That happened. Uh, Puma was number seven, and honestly, for his entrance, didn't do much. Yeah, he just came out. He's trying to win a title. Yeah. Not perform. Eva Lise was number eight. She is Son of Havoc's side piece. So she actually hit... Side piece? <laughs> she hit some great <laughs> offense sexist. here when she hit the ring. And uh, just as I was thinking there was too much dead weight in this match, Son of Havoc pinned Pimpinella with a shooting star press. That was awesome. So Drago was number nine. He hit Phoenix with some kind of bot spot that spiked Phoenix's head right into the mat. And there was some editing in here. Cuerno pinned Eva Lee with a fireman's carry into a Mitch Noku driver. Number nine was Bale, who was also in The Crew. Toss like a bale of hay, coincidentally. Bale came out. I had no idea who Bale was, and then Stryker helped me to identify him, saying, saying he is a real B-boy from the streets. Oh. That doesn't help me at all. But yes, he is in Rick's crew. Puma pin Havoc. Cortez Castro was number 11, also in the crew. So Ricky Mandel, no idea who he was. He came out. He was not very good, frankly. So Ricky Mandel was number 12, and after he came out, like back-to-back, Bale and Castro got eliminated. And just then, Big Rick came out to be number 13. His whole plan was he'd have his all his flunkies there to help him win, and now they were all gone. So Castro and Bale pull themselves up to their feet on the floor, and they're standing next to each other. 
And they just look up at their boss like, we're sorry, dude. He fucked up. And Big Rick looks back and forth at them, and he sneers, and he pushes them away to either side, sends them both flying, and enters the ring to take care of business on his own. Big Rick and his crew are so awesome in the show because they are not like anyone else. No. There's no act remotely like Big Rick and the crew in you know Lucha Underground. why he was referred to as a B-boy from the streets? No. It's B-boy. Oh. Well, that makes sense. It's that was the clue. Yeah. So Rick killed everyone for a while. There were a lot of guys in the ring at this point, and uh, I kind of lost track of eliminations. Pentagon Jr. was 14. Superfly was 15. And then Chavo Guerrero was 16. And uh, he came out with a steel chair and began to hit people in the head with it. That's right. Longtime close personal friend of Chris Benoit striking everybody in the head with steel chairs. Yes. I don't approve. No. Oh. Which, by the way, begs the question, why did it take 16 guys for somebody to come out with a weapon since Dario Cueto made it very clear anything goes? Well, only Chavo Guerrero has that little honor. I see. He's even, very diabolical. I should have known, actually, because that makes sense. Even Big Rick would rather use his giant muscles. Well, they were effectively killing everybody, including... Which brings us to... <laughs> young... Actually, he's not young. I think he's... I think he's... Somebody said there's a new Mascarita Sagrada. I see. But Mascarita Sagrada was number 17. And this is the point where he appeared at the top of the stairs and they went to commercial. And when they came back, he was still coming down the stairs. He hit the ring, ran wild with on Chavo, who, of course, has experience selling for short people. He's running wild on everyone, Sagrada is. He's kicking Phoenix's ass. And he tries something off the apron. And Phoenix drop kicks the fuck out of him right out of midair. He is. He's 50. This is the 50-year-old. Well, I hope he makes it to 51. Dude, when I'm 50, Phoenix if anybody really drop kicks me hard. as I'm coming off the apron, I will retire and file a lawsuit. Yes. Phoenix was... He showed no mercy. He, no, he showed no mercy. He kicked him hard and sent him changing direction in midair, going the other way. Well, have you ever had like a fly in the room and you bat the fly and it flies and smashes into the wall and then just keeps flying? I suppose that's true. Yeah, a small, small being with not a lot of weight. Yeah. It's not like the big show falling off the apron. I suppose that's true. Number 18 was Sexy Star in her Miss Marvel Halloween costume. She attacked Chavo, her longtime enemy. And then it came down to Big Rick and Sagrada. Oh, man. Big Rick is, I don't know, 6'5", 320. He's a huge, huge, huge human being. Mascarita Sagrada is like maybe four feet tall, maybe 80 pounds. He's a small, small, small human being. For about 30 seconds, Mascarita Sagrada played keep away. He flipped over Big Rick's back. He went between his legs. He slid this way and that. And he was too small and too fast, like a fly, in fact. That's right. And Big Rick Very could, much like a fly. Big Rick could do nothing with him. And then Mascarita Sagrada got cocky. And he stood there, and he planted his feet in the mat, and he waved his hands towards himself as if to say, bring it on! And why was he cocky? Because after avoiding all of these moves, Big Rick finally lifts him up, and he drop kicks Big Rick in the chest. Yes. Which, by the way, does not knock Big Rick off his feet. It only sends him backwards a little bit. But little Mascarita Sagrada is so proud yes. that he begins... He actually began doing what Torito does. He begins to twerk. Sure. And he taunted Big Rick and dared him to try again. And Big Rick sized up this little man. And he raised his arm high into the sky and brought it crashing down across Sagrada's face with a clothesline of utter death. And he pinned him. Now, everybody, I know you're listening to this, and you're thinking that Vinny screwed something up. How could a man the size of Big Rick, 6'6", six, six most likely, how could he clothesline little tiny four foot five Mascarita Sagrada? That doesn't make any sense. Well, you know what? You're right. Because it was a falling clothesline. If you imagine a great, mighty tree branch snapping off the size of a redwood tree, 
and falling down and, and crushing somebody. That is what happened to young Mascarita Sagrada. And the only thing I want to add to Vinny's very accurate reporting of this is that when he says Big Rick sizes up the man and he raises his arm in the air, don't for one moment think that there was any hesitation here. Big Rick is stumbling backwards, and little Mascarita Sagrada begins pumping his fists joyfully, and Big Rick just fell and smashed him to death. That to was, death! That was the end of Mascarita Sagrada. That was, in fact, the pinfall. So that right there was the best thing I ever saw in my entire life. I have never... <laughs> I, first, I screamed. Then I started laughing. Then we rewound it. And then we laughed more. And then we felt great remorse. It was such an amazing spot. <laughs> the little guy finally... After all of the running around, drop kicked the big man, and he starts hulking up like he's about to do a series of giant high spots, but instead, the big guy just falls and crushes Cut. and kills him. Clubbed him. Oh, that was amazing. There was no skill to the strike. There was no technique. Just a giant arm. Big Rick's arm may outweigh Mascarita Sagrada. That's right. And it just came flying down to earth. And you know what's funny is, is I have watched so much wrestling in my lifetime that I can watch great matches that I've never seen, and I usually know what's coming. Like, I always, I always knew when Shawn Michaels was going to hit that supposed surprise super kick. Always. I could always call when Kurt Angle was going to slip behind for a German or do an ankle lock out of something or whatever. I can always see when these things are coming with the great workers. When they put Big Rick and Masquerita Sagrada in the ring, I could have come up with a hundred scenarios that these two men could have done together. First off, I wouldn't have put these two men in the ring together because I would not have thought that it would have ended up as great as it did. But if somebody had told me they've got to be in the ring together, I would have come up with a million different scenarios. And you know what? They came up with a scenario I did not imagine. But after it happened, I could not have imagined anything better. This was perfect. Except for poor Mascarita Sagrada. <laughs> for whom it sucked. Who may be dead. So. Pe Pequeño Lucky is one of his ring names. <laughs> no longer. <laughs> no longer is Pequeño Lucky one of the ring names of young Mascarita Sagrada. So there was more to come. That was not the end of the match. He has gone from Mini Nova, another ring name, to Mini Coma. I shouldn't make fun of this poor guy's death, but wow. Anyway, proceed. Mariachi Loco was number 19. Here is one of the points where there was an edit, and suddenly everyone in the ring switched corners. I don't know if it's an edit or if they just switched the hard camera. That, I, the cameras are in weird positions. I went back and forth on this because it, it, I think they have, there's one, the hard camera they use most of the time that is facing the stairway. Where the guys come out, and actually they use, they use it all the time. They appeared to have another camera like on the right hand side, but from the exact same angle of the ring. So it may have been that. They don't need both of these cameras, everyone. I should not get confused about this kind of thing. So uh, the last man in it was Mil Muertes. Everyone, everyone tried to fly at him, but he punched them. That's right. Socked him in the nostrils. I love Lucha Underground. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best show. Everyone stands out and is different from each other. We got the face off between the big monsters, Big Rick and Mil Muertes, but it only went like two shoulder blocks, and then everyone attacked them and separated them because clearly they wouldn't have a bigger showdown down the road. That's right. Just a tease here. So everyone started hitting Big Rick with moves, but Chavo would try to throw them out and steal the pin because he's the glory hound. Finally, Chavo fell on top of Rick, and Phoenix had a 450 onto both of them and, and laid on top of him. So Rick got pinned, but in effect, it, it took two men to do it. Not only that, it took four finishers and two men. Yes. Because he'd been being hit with finishers over and over, and Chavo was trying to f steal the glory. Four finishers and two men to pin Big Rick. That's right. This is not even Stephen Booking. No. No. Some people are, in fact, higher on the card and more powerful than others. 
Chavo started hitting dudes in the head with chairs again. Sexy ran wild on him for a bit, but he caught her and slammed her onto a chair. He laid the chair across her face and went up top to finish her off, but Blue Demon made his big return to make the save. That's right. And Blue Demon's doing stuff with the Chavo, and Sexy's got the chair behind him, and Demon points behind Chavo, and Chavo turns around, and Sexy swings the chair, and Chavo gets both hands way up in front of his face. Now, it's not his fault that other guys are not putting their hands up. But after he hit like a half dozen dudes, watching him put both hands up, I mean, good for him. I would rather he did get the hands up. I guess everyone else should have, really. So Sexy pinned him. It's always your job to get your hands up, no matter how hard or light the guy swings the chair. Yes. I don't think you should swing a chair at anybody's head, but you gotta you got to protect yourself. That's the way things used to be done. Yes. So and that- think about that. Think about that season-long storyline, by the way. It all came to a head here in this big show. Blue Demon returned. He helped Sexy Star get a revenge on Chavo Guerrero. The heel Chavo got his in the end, and she got her big win. Great. And it gets better. There's more to come. Came down to the final four of Johnny Mundo, Prince Puma, Mil Muertes, and yes, Sexy Star. And Sexy's running wild, Hurricane Ronnie, everyone. And then she turns around and Muertes uh, spears at her death and pins her. And then my, Matt Stryker said, he was trying to say, like, good for her, she gave it her best. But what his actual words were was, in the end, we only regret the chances we didn't take. That's not true. <laughs> That's a lie. Next time you get your paycheck, everyone, take it to a casino and bet on zero. And most of you will regret taking that chance. That's right. So the three dudes kept doing stuff. The last portion of this match was so great. First off, Muertes is in there with Johnny Mundo and Prince Puma. And... Muertes is a scary man. But you know what? Johnny Mundo never gives up. He's a fighter. He's always there. He's always going to fight. He's never going to back down because he's a babyface, correct? That's right. However, he accidentally, in throwing a kick, hits Katrina, who is Mil Muertes' woman, and he knocks Katrina off the apron. If this were ECW or any other promotion in the world, you know what would happen next. He would celebrate, everybody would cheer for him, blah, blah, blah. But this is Lucha Underground, where things make sense. And let me tell you what happens. He accidentally kicks Katrina, and he realizes, I have just kicked this man's girlfriend in the face and knocked her on her ass. And Johnny Mundo's response is to get down on his knees and begin to profusely apologize. Meanwhile, Mil Muertes is fucking pissed. And Johnny Mundo knows, no matter how tough I am, no matter what a valiant babyface who never backs down I may be, I fucked up and this guy's going to kill me. And he is in fear for his life. I thought this was so amazing because this is a real reaction it doesn't matter how tough you are if you accidentally punch some guy's girlfriend and this little skinny guy gets pissed off you're gonna run when he comes after you you're gonna run until you suddenly both realize what the fuck's going on and then you'll both turn around and you'll start chasing him just like we did in the baghead bandit this was an amazing reaction that would really happen in real life I'm really glad you explained that because I was typing at the key moment and I thought Muertes had bumped into Katrina. I didn't realize it was Mundo. No, he almost bumped into her, but he got out of the way and then Mundo kicked ah, her in the face and I knocked see. her off the apron. Okay. And then Mundo was like, oh I, shit. Because I did see Mundo on his knees and was trying to figure out why he was so despondent. Yes, because he knew he was about to die. He knew he was about to die and he was also he felt guilty. That's right. He didn't want to kick a woman. He was trying profusely to apologize for yes. what he'd accidentally done because he knew now he was dead. I see. 
And amazingly, he wasn't because there were two men going up against this man, Muertes. So they eventually wore him down. And they kept... This is not two men fighting one. This is three men each fighting for themselves. And gradually, it occurred to two of them, that one guy is way bigger than me. I'm going to need help to beat him. And they were able to wear him down and get him flat in his back in the ring. And the two small guys selling on opposite sides of the ring, they made eye contact, they climbed to their respective aprons, and they took her, took turns hitting springboard 450 splashes, and then they both pinned him. Again! <laughs> they protected Mira Muertes as best as they could. That's right, it was his first ever pinfall, and boy, did these guys have to work to pin him. Yes, they had to give it all they had. Now, if you all hearken back to the very first episode of Lucha Underground, you will recall that the main event of that very first episode of Lucha Underground was, in fact, Prince Puma against Johnny Mundo. And they had a great match. And they had been pushing throughout the show very hard, this Prince Puma fella. He's a young guy, he's an Aztec warrior, Conan is behind him, he's a big star. And then at the end of the show, Johnny Mundo pinned Prince Puma. And as great as the show was, and as great as the match was, and as much as it didn't really hurt Prince Puma that bad because it was a really, really great match, there was that part of you that thought, Do they really need to put Johnny Mundo over Prince Puma here on the first show? Was that really necessary? Why did they do that and not build this matchup for a period of time? And I do believe that part of it was because something happened in the tapings, and I think they were forced to put that match in the main event of the first show. But the point of this is, that was the main event of the first show. And here in the culminating episode of the first series, they do this championship match. Aztec warfare match for the title. And who does it come down to at the very end? Johnny Mundo and Prince Puma. How fucking about that? And what happened? They had a great match again. And in the end, after a dozen near falls of a dozen big moves, Prince Puma redeemed himself. He was able to lay Mundo out. He went up top. He had a move that I don't know if he'd hit in Lucha Underground before, but Stryker knew it. The 630 Centon. It's a double somersault off the top rope and splats onto Mundo, then covers him to win the match and become the first Lucha Underground champion. That's right. Yes. Only then, only when Puma was champion, did his mentor Conan come out before the live crowd. That's right. He had never, ever appeared in person before, only in backstage segments. And he came out to congratulate his man, and Mundo and Puma shook hands. Unfortunately, that's right where ours cut off. That's right. That was the end of the show. Yeah. This show is so great. This show is so great. This is the best show on television. This is better than NXT. Oh, yeah. The NXT big shows last year were awesome. Do not get me wrong. But on a week-to-week basis, Lucha Underground is the best wrestling show in this country every single week. There's no exception. It is so awesome. We didn't even talk about Muertes after he was eliminated, carrying his girl to the back like a movie monster. Yes, like Frankenstein. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man, what a great show. If you have not been watching Lucha Underground, everybody, you are missing out. I'm telling you right now. It's only one hour long. It goes by so fast. There's never any pointless, boring, useless segments on this show. It is only what needs to air. The matches are the perfect length. They don't waste their time with stupid bullshit interviews. The angles all make sense. Most of all, and I've ranted about this for years, Here is a show, and NXT does this as well, as does ROH. So this is not the only show that does this. Ring of Honor does this very well, as does NXT. But SmackDown, Raw, and TNA, it's a big fuck you to the viewer. This show rewards you, the viewer, if you pay attention. Which is what a great television show should do. 
As a viewer, I am giving my time. I am giving the most valuable thing that I have in this world to Lucha Underground. Time. Because everybody listening to this right now, I don't want to get philosophical. Everybody listening to this right now, one of these days is going to be dead. The only thing, the most valuable thing every one of us has is our time. And when we give our time to a show, we should be rewarded for that as a viewer. Raw and SmackDown and Impact usually give us a big fuck you. Because they don't care about you, the viewer, in the sense that if you pay attention, you're usually not rewarded at all. You feel like an idiot for paying attention. You feel like an idiot for caring. But this show here rewards you for giving them your time. And that's what they do, and that's why I love this show. Everything makes sense. It's paid off. I watched the first episode. I watched the whole season, and it paid off here at the end. With all of these different storylines, the final match, the winner, everything. It all paid off for me as a viewer. So watch Lucha Underground, everybody. Stop watching one of these other shows and watch Lucha Underground because it's great. Amen, brother. Amen. It is the highlight of the week besides the old Nitros. The old Nitros are pretty good, but that ain't going to last. I know. Well, I <laughs> hate to tell you, Vinny. I, I, I'm aware. These good times will not last forever. It does get bad in the end. All right, let's... Uh, pl- Who cares? All right, let's move on to the shows here tonight. Not playing a song or anything? Nah, we'll play one in We'll play one in between here. Right, let's start the- with NXT. We don't got all night. Let's start with NXT. NXT. Actually, you know what? We'll go in order. Let's start with Lucha Underground. Lucha Underground. Are you aware, Vinny, that Lucha Underground is getting ready to tape again? For I guess whatever the next, if it's the next season or whatever, but it will shock you to learn that tickets are very difficult to get this time around. Oh, really? Yeah, they've they've sold a lot of tickets, so apparently this show is catching on with people as it should. It is a great show. This is the best show on television, although. It's a toss-up this week because NXT was very, very good. I think NXT was probably better. Uh, ooh. Mm. But it was very close. These are both great. Yeah. So it opened with Dario Cueto. Meaning Actually, with- before that, it opened up with a video of the entire season from day one, and they very plainly showed you that Prince Puma won the championship last week. But earlier in the season, there had been a multi-person match, and in that match, Phoenix had pinned Prince Puma. Which, if you'll recall at the time, we were like, why in God's name did Phoenix pin Prince Puma? As Vinny will explain, now we know why. Yes. So Dario is really, really sucking up to Phoenix, putting him over as a great fighter, a worldwide talent, and a badass who had already won a 10-man match beating Prince Puma in the process. And then, even after Dario had made him enter first in Aztec Warfare, he has still fought very valiantly and and shown in the match. He offered Phoenix a chance to live up to his name. And when he said this, I thought, why would you want to do that? Because that means you're light on fire. And as he said this, Phoenix blinked and was taken aback. Like, I don't want to light on fire. But Quito explained he was giving him a chance to rise from the ashes. He could defeat Puma and the process embarrass Conan. So Phoenix was sitting there listening the entire time, not speaking. Then he spoke in Spanish with subtitles. He explained he did not fight for Quito. He fought for himself. And he just wanted to be the best wrestler in the world. And Quito said, look, fight for me, fight for yourself, whatever. Just get the job done or I'll get someone else to do it. And Phoenix left, and they showed a woman spying on this meeting. You know when you mentioned the thing about going up in flames? I just remembered. The other day, we're in class. And a guy lit on fire? No. But I don't know how... I'm trying to figure out where the hell this story could possibly go. I'm going to tell you where it's going to go. I don't know how we got to talking about it, but everyone's lined up ready to start class. And... One of the kids is doing something weird. Like kids, you know, kids just are weird and they like pull their face down. So like the yeah. 
Yeah. Make faces. And there's this one kid's That's making fun. faces. And Whitney looks at this kid and she goes, you look like your face is melting. Stop that. And as soon as, as, soon as she says, you look like your face is melting, this little girl next to him, who I believe just turned 10, looks at Whitney and just goes, people burn. I was like, wow. All right. They don't melt, Vinny. They burn. Mm. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. So Phoenix is right. You don't want to burn. Avoid burning, everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It opened with a four-way elimination match. I guess the first match was a four-way elimination match. It opened with a video in the media in Cueto's office. Aerostar versus Argenis. Probably saying that wrong. Versus Angelico versus Cage. Yes. Vinny somehow does not remember Brian Cage. I remember the hype video that they aired months back on this show. No, he did He did gut check in TNA, and he was like the best guy they had in a long time, and then I believe they cut him, if I recall correctly. I do not remember. remember. Anyway, he was very talented. He's a very talented guy. He's also enormous. He looks like a guy that shouldn't be talented, but he is. He looks like the two guys in high voltage had a kid. That's right. The other three dudes, of course, are very, very small, and they were there to fly through the air and fall all, fall all over the place and uh, make Cage look good. And that's what they did at the beginning, and that's what they did at the end. And in the, in the middle, they all got a chance to shine. So that is what happened, in fact. Cage threw them around, slammed around a bit. They triple teamed him and knocked him out of the ring. They all hit dives on each other, and Cage returned. Uh... He caught one of them in the uh, the spot where you catch a guy in suplex position. It was Aerostar. He came yeah. off the top for like that flying headbutt, and Cage caught him in vertical suplex position and held him there. Yes, like uh, Lashley did to Kenny King a few months back. Awesome. Yep. Probably where he stole it from. Yeah. Uh, they, they, although the announcers were sure to say they had never seen it before, which is possible. Even Matt Stryker can't watch Impact every week. So everyone hit uh, another dive again. Angelico hit the scariest dive I've seen, well, for about 10 minutes, it was the scariest dive I've seen in a while. Crazy. It was a running dive across the ring, flying over the post onto the pile of men outside. Yeah, imagine a normal running tope like the Usos do over the top rope, but he went corner to corner over the post. And that meant he had to clear the post, and that meant that he had to be running very, very, very fast. So he flew through the air, and he cleared the post, and then he hit these men at a 1,000 miles an hour, like catching a comet. It was awesome. And uh, eventually, enough was enough, and Cage began to very violently slam men into the mat and pin them. Finally, he pinned Angelica with a lariat, and that was that. He pinned all three men. He had uh, giant muscles, and he cut a promo. (laughs) Well, it's true. He cut a promo saying, they call me Cage because I am not a man. I am a machine. What? I don't know. Sometimes it's better to be scripted. Or silent. Yeah. This this promo hurt him, for sure. What I loved about this match, everything I love about all of these shows, Lucha Underground and NXT, is all stuff that they fuck up on Raw. It's crazy. I feel like I do this show every week, and all of my analysis is telling you the most basic shit that used to work that nobody does anymore. It's a sad state of affairs. But what they did was they tried in this match to make sure that everybody got over, but they made sure Cage got over the most since he was winning. Correct. The exact opposite of what they do in WWE. WWE, whichever guy is going over, especially if he's going to be going over for a title, They make sure this guy is a loser before he wins. Yes. Why? I got no fucking idea. But these guys, they wanted Brian Cage to get over, and so they had him get over. Great. There's an even better example coming up, but it's on NXT. I'll save it for that. Chavo Guerrero called Blue uh, Blue Demon Jr. out of the ring. Now this was straight out of Raw. So he can make an apology. So Demon comes out and he sits down. And Chavo says, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry for not exposing you as a fraud. Man, never heard that one before. I'm sorry for not ripping your mask off. And Demon just sat there. I'm not sure he actually understands English. And uh, He might have thought he was really getting an apology. He might have. So there was a, one great moment here where, and it would only work on this show, as Chava was talking, the camera zooms in on one of his hands, and that hand slips into his pocket and pulls out brass knucks. Because as we've noted, they don't try to pretend they're alive. So it would make sense that the director and the cameraman would know Chava was about to take out brass knucks. So Chavo goes to attack, but Blue Demon avoids the Nux, takes him down, throws a couple of chairs into his head, and Chavo leaves, and that's that. You know, it was interesting because Stryker afterwards was talking about how this feud was now all wrapped up. And it sounded to me, I could be wrong, but I have a decent ear, it sounded to me like this was done in post. Post whatever they normally do. So I don't know if maybe they were planning on doing more with Chavo and Blue Demon, and maybe something happened and Blue Demon's no longer with the company. I don't know. But it sounded like this was something added in later, and maybe they were planning to continue, but now the feud is all wrapped up and done, which is fine. We do not need to see another Chavo Guerrero Blue Demon match. <laughs> no, we didn't, or certainly not a series of them. King Cuerno versus Drago. Crano's gimmick is that he is a mighty hunter. And so he came out wearing a deer head on his head. Not just antlers, an entire deer head. This is the best. This is the best outfit in all of wrestling. I've always hoped that as I get older, I can start getting away with stuff like that. Like when I go to the WrestleMania convention, I want to show up someday wearing a deer head. Or maybe if there's something in the winter, I could wear a full bear skin outfit. I love this. He wore it down to the ring. He removed it. He looked it in the eye. And then he set it on the top rope, on the post, I should say, looking into the ring so the deer head could watch the match. So they did a match. It was a little funny at first because they pulled out a table and they teased spots through it but never delivered. Meanwhile, as they were teasing very safe basic table bumps, they were hitting these very scary dives and flips and insane things. And then they did the finish. Oh, yeah. They're on the floor and Drago hits a super kick. And Cuerno sells the super kick by gently laying himself across the table. At that point, they cut to a camera high, high in the rafters. And you can see the back row, and the backs of the heads of the people in the back row. And you see stairs, and stairs leading down to the ring. And down at the bottom of the stairs, seemingly miles and miles and miles away, itty-bitty Drago. And then Drago turns, and he sprints as fast as he can up the stairs right into the camera getting larger and larger with each step like a train coming at you and he ran up to the top of the stairs as fast as he could he moved through the crowd over to a platform that was over where this table was the announcers were saying it was 15 18 feet it was at least 12 he was very very high up there and he poses like he's about to jump and matt striker screams somebody's about to die i'm not sure he was wrong because Drago jumped off, he fell at least a dozen feet to earth, and though his pelvis fell across the table, his face was way out in front, he barely slowed down at all, and he bonked face first onto the mat and proceeded to not move. That was scary. Both men were countered out, and doctors came out to take the bodies away. Well, I thought the dude was dead. He came off this balcony, and no joke, if you watch this, it looks like the very first thing that hit the cement was, in fact, his face. Then the table broke. I mean, this was, this was the scariest-looking thing you ever saw. Did you ever see where Charlie Manson fell off the ladder? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it oh, looked, yeah. It actually looked a lot like that. 
Only well, higher. Charlie Manson was badly fucked up by that spot. Yes, that's my point. And I did, in fact, immediately after watching this, I sent out some emails, and I can happily report that Drago is fine. Yay! Apparently, it looked a hell of a lot worse than it actually was. And Dave on the radio show yesterday was talking about how he was unhappy with the way that this ended up because he felt it was very TNA to the back. The guy nearly dies. They stop the match. Guys come out to cart him away. And that's the end of that. And to a degree, he is right. Yeah. I mean, this was, they could have played this up big time. They didn't even turn it into after the break. They what? They did not even show a replay. No, after that's the break. my point. I've mentioned yeah. this for weeks. They never show a replay on this show because Lucha Underground is not a wrestling show. It's a show about wrestling. So in a normal program, when something like this happened, they'd show 9 million replays and they'd play it up really big. But because of the way that Lucha Underground is created, there are no replays. There are no multiple replays of anything. They should have stayed on a little longer. They should have gone to the announcers. I mean, this is something. It looks so bad. You could have done a dream sequence down the road if you don't want to do a replay. But they could have played this up for quite a while in the season and and even done deals where, you know, he's in rehab. He's trying to get ready to come back. There's a lot of things you could have done, but it was brutal. I mean, if you watch this and you don't know what happened, you're sure this dude's dead. They did, in fact, move on. Main event, Prince Puma making his first title defense against Phoenix. Had a great Phoenix highlight video explaining that after every fall and every defeat, he will come back to life and fly even higher. And they showed him rising out of the fire and kicking a guy. It was awesome. So they opened with some very, very basic lucha. A lot of flips involved. And Stryker had his ups and downs in the show. Definitely, on, on the whole, probably his worst show on Lucha Underground. Far more annoying than usual. But God bless him, he tried to explain that the reason they were doing all these flips was to test each other's timing. He did his best to make Lucha seem realistic. To test each other's timing? Their, their timing and their... Uh, what the fuck does that even mean? Test their timing. Well, to see how quickly he can react when I do this. How about you just try and hit him? Oh, that might work too. Yeah, Lucha is not uh, real. He tried to make it realistic. But even if it is real, you're not testing someone's timing. That's like saying boxing is is merely two men testing each other's timing for 12 rounds. Well, the, the, have you ever heard the term feeling out process? Well, yes. It's but basically what it means. Kind of. Anyway, who cares? All right. So this was much, much slower than anything else I've seen in Lucha Underground. That is not a complaint, just an observation. Slower? Compared to most matches we see on this show? I guess it was. It, they, it's like a video game from the, the Bell. The he portion, at least, the least. I guess. Yeah, I'm not complaining. <laughs> it's just different. I just saw it completely differently, but All right. at the end of the day, there was a lot of moves. They did do a lot of moves, and, and, and even when they were doing slow, when, when they were doing 50 moves a minute instead of 100 moves a minute, it was still 50 cool moves. They were just selling more in between. So, did a bunch of near falls. And then they did one of the greatest finishes I've ever seen in my life. You must all track this down. It's on YouTube. There are torrents. I don't know if it has replays or if it's online anywhere else. But for God's sake, watch the last 20 seconds of this match. Phoenix sits Puma on the top rope. On the top turnbuckle. And then he goes across the ring to the other top rope. And I am trying to figure out what the hell he is going to do. And what he did, which I did not see coming, was to charge across the rope, like a tightrope, like a cat, running at his opponent. And I don't know what he had in mind. Well, that's kind of the key. I don't know what his plan was. You said when he went up to the top rope, I didn't know what he was going to do, and I still don't know what he was going to do. No. And in fact, we were watching with Whitney, and after the big move happened, she was like, what was he trying to do? I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. But he ran at Puma. But unfortunately for Phoenix, Puma met him with a high kick to the head. Super kicked him right in the face. And Phoenix crashed Earth, almost literally in flames. And Puma finished him off with the 630 senton. 
That was amazing. That was amazing. I, honest to God, think what he was trying to do was he was trying to tightrope his way across into a Hurricane Rana. Sure. I'll bet that you That would anything. make sense. But he failed. He was kicked instead. He ran his way into a boot. Yes. And fell down and was squished. This was aerial warfare at its finest. So Puma is celebrating, and who should hit the ring but Cage? And Cage attacked him. He began to powerbomb him, slamming him to the ground over and over and over again like he was the Hulk and Puma was Loki. And that was the end. That was a great damn pro wrestling show right there. Yeah, I was fixing it not like that main event. I saw it differently from you. I just saw two guys that just did nine million moves. And there was just something about it. And don't even tell me. I don't want to hear any numbskulls out there saying that Brian doesn't like matches with a lot of moves. Because I've seen and I've watched 9 million matches with 9 million moves in the last couple of months, and I've liked 95% of them. But sometimes you get a match and it's just a bunch of moves. And it doesn't feel like it's building to anything. It's just a bunch of moves. And that's what this was for about three quarters of the match. But the last quarter of the match, even though I was fixing to not like it, I loved it by the end. They turned it into a great match. They had a great finish. It's a it's a classic example of if you can make the last quarter of a match great, most people are going to forget the first three quarters. It wasn't all that great. You can see it on Raw all the time. When there is a top of the second hour match and it just goes on forever and nothing is happening, And finally they go to the near falls and a guy kicks out of one move too many or one move enough or whatever the term might be. And that one kick out is enough for the fans to start chanting, this is awesome. Even though, let me tell you, this was not awesome. It was just one great near fall. But because it happened at the end, that's what people remember. And what I remember about this match was the awesome finish and that it was great. And I think that Brian Cage and Puma is actually going to be a hell of a feud. Mark my words. Brian Cage and Puma are going to have some great matches. Let's play a song. Ladies and gentlemen, www.frisco-com has finally arrived. Johnny Badass walking through the bar with his little tap out shirt on. What the hell is that shit? Doing your little jujitsu, getting focused and shit. You ain't great for bastards. Cock burn doom bug. Out of control. Needless to say, shit hit the fan. We walking out Dr. Phil, he shit his I heard him checking his Yes, sir, we got bumper tickets. I'm putting on my dime. There you go, put it right on there. I'm thing. putting on my dime. I wouldn't blame you. I drive to die, huh? Four too soft, step too heavy. Hop in my dodge and drive to the levee. I drive for die. Drive for die. Come on. That's right. Quick song. Give me the microphone and get out of the way. Let me tell you something. This is not your man country. I'm Randy Savage. I'm the greatest professional wrestler ever to be in the world. You know where you are right now, Wayne Russell? Settle down. You're in Macho Man Country, man. You're in Macho Man Country, man. Listen, a lot of people out there would like to stop me, but they can't. No, they can't. I'm the greatest because I'm too good. In fact, I'm real good, Lance Russell. I'm real good. He said you weren't a good athlete. I'm the best in the world. Hey, sorry. Hey, hey, sorry. Hey, come on now. Don't mess with me. Come on. Macho Man Country right here. Macho Man Country. Good suggestion from Angelo Papo. He said, let's leave these hey. Boy, I tell you. Thank you. Ugh. Macho Man Country. Yeah, I, I hear it. This is Macho Man Country. 
fine job. Fine job. Lucha Underground. Lucha Underground. Opening match was Cortez Castro and Mr. Cisco, two members of Big Rick's crew, versus Masquerita Sagrada and Pimpinella Escarlata. Oh, man, this show. This show was all about weird matches. You had two men against a mini and a transvestite. You had a man against a woman. It's crazy. So this whole match, about 80% of it, was Pimpinella doing comedy spots, making men uncomfortable by hugging them and kissing them. And they got beat up for he got beat up for a while. And uh, when they cut this guy off, I don't know how old Pimpinella Escarlata is. He's 47. Been doing this a long time. They cut him off and immediately started kicking him in the face. <laughs> oh, yeah. Careful, guys. That's all I'm saying. So after being in the ring for almost all the match, Pimpy makes the hot tag to Sagrada. Sagrada gets like 30 seconds of offense, and then gets wiped out, thrown on the floor, and disappears. It's a burial of Sagrada. Pimpy ran wild for a bit, and then they threw Sagrada back in the ring and pinned him with a double-team backcracker. A burial of the little fella. I should also mention, when they had the heat on Pimpy to set up the hot tag, the way he cut them off was they charged him in the corner, and he jumped on the middle rope and stuck his ass out. Yes. And the guy kept running, unable to stop, and his face went into Pimpy's ass. It's better. All right. Pimpinella jumps up on the middle rope like Vader does before he's going to do the Vader bomb. So he's got his feet on the middle ropes, and he's got his hands on like the top rope or the turnbuckle or whatever, and he's, he's bent over. And he doesn't just stay there. As the man runs at him, he thrusts his ass even further out into the man's face. It is an offensive ass strike. Hip attack in wrestling, they're called. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, that was the whole thing. My God, that cat is loud. There's a yelling cat out there. Yeah. So Big Rick came out. You missed, by the way, when Big Rick came out at the beginning, and he was just appalled at the behavior of Pimpy. Yes. So he let everyone, including his crew, know that uh, he's warning everyone that he was challenging whoever held the gold and no one was going to stop him or get in his way. And then his crew turned on him. They chop blocked him from behind. They beat him with a stick for a while. And then they stuck a lit cigar in his face. Man. Bastards. So much disrespect for Big Rick. And then they left. Your favorite crew, Vinny. It's like, all the, broken the, the, the up now. It lasted, did not last long. And then the crew left him, and they did not go to the locker room. They went straight to Dario Quito's office. That's right. Dario's mad at him for something. Didn't want to go along with some plan. So they went to commercial, and they came back in, in Quito's office. He paid off the crew, congratulated them for a job well done, and said there'd be more money coming if they would watch his back. And they all smiled and agreed. The announcers let us know that Rick had been taken to a medical facility. I sure fucking hope so. <laughs> Got a lit cigarette in his eye or a cigar. Yes. Vampiro did a sit-down interview with Cage. I got to talk about this. It was very, very heavily edited. It was quite hilarious. God bless Cage. Not a very good promo. He delivered a whole bunch of wooden dialogue. Vampiro is a much better speaker, and he had some very wacky dialogue, and better yet, he had some hilarious facial expressions whenever Cage said something controversial. So, as I've mentioned a million times, this is not a wrestling show. This is a television show about wrestling, and it is consistent from beginning to end. They have credits at the beginning. They have credits at the end. They never show a replay. They shoot it in a certain manner, more like a television show than a sporting event. And as a result, they had all of that weird, dramatic music going on in the background, and it worked. That shit never works in WWE, and it never works in TNA, but it worked here. And I don't know if it was the editing job or how they put everything together or the clips that they used when they talked about everything, but they somehow turned what should have been a very goofy, probably quite terrible interview into something that actually worked. It was amazing. 
Okay. You mm-hmm. didn't think so? Uh, I didn't think uh, Caves was that bad. It helped that it was edited a lot, as you noted. So they could basically do this one line at a time. I mostly like Vampiro's interaction with him. <laughs> yes, this was great. Cage was trying to be, well, what his gimmick is, he's trying to be every big musclehead wrestler ever. And Vampiro is just Vampiro. And he's, uh, I said Cage had a lot of heat with the boys in the locker room, and Cage said he didn't give a shit. He was there to win titles, not make friends. And Vamp said, I, I almost admire you, but I'm not quite a fan yet. Whatever Vampiro said. I can't do a Vampiro invitation. <laughs> no one can. And he's just Vampiro all the time. But yes, the the, the whole thing did work. I, I, I don't know if I would say Vampiro is a good student interviewer like this. I don't know if I'd say he's a good interviewer, but he's just great at being Vampiro. Yes, you, you, you definitely, he gets your attention. Yes, he's he's unlike anybody else. Yes. Which is what you want in wrestling. It is much better than... You have a match tonight. Tell me your thoughts. That's right. Yes. Superfly versus Pentagon Jr. I really like this Pentagon Jr. He beat the crap out of this guy. Oh, yeah. Chopped the shit out of him. Chopped the hell out of him. Slammed him on the floor. Fly made a comeback that involved a lot of flips. And flying. And flying. They took turns doing stuff for a while. And then Pentagon won with a package pile driver. And then Pentagon cut a promo. Now, as you, I'm sure you know, Brian, the winner of the uh, Best Announcer Award this year went to the guy from New Japan. That's right. And this is cost... No, he's second place, actually. Second place. Uh, the, the... See, I saw, I saw the debate more than I even saw the award. But uh, yeah, people are saying, how could it be a great announcer if you don't understand a word he says? Listen, I don't understand a word Pentagon said here. And yes, he had subtitles. But even if the subtitles hadn't been there, this promo was awesome. <laughs> this man was pissed. Now, he did have subtitles, so I understand his general point. He said he thought Chavo Guerrero was a legend, but Chavo, in fact, was a fraud. He was not the man Pentagon wanted to help him. He had found someone else to mentor him and and to guide him. And finally, he declared he was Pentagon Jr., and he had no fear. This was great. Sexy Star versus El Mariachi Loco. (laughs) Oh, man. Every time Mariachi comes out, it's the same story from Matt Stryker. I could not handle Matt Stryker on the show this year. Matt evening. Stryker was awful. Oh, God. Especially in the main event. You know but- what it is? You know what? It finally hit me. Matt Stryker is a guy who is just trying to be a cool guy. And he tries so fucking hard to be a cool guy He's got to say the cool insider terms. He's got to show his cool insider hardcore fan knowledge. And he just tries too fucking hard. Just be yourself and call the match. Jesus. So Ma- take it tonight. It was actually much worse than the main event. Mariachi is a great bottom card guy in that he has his offense looks good. Oh, it's really his over-the-top, cartoony, goofy selling when the other person's beating him up. Perfect opening match heel here in the semi-main, but what are you going to do? So, uh, eventually, they did a bunch of dives, and Sexy got the win with a small package. Great. I liked it because I don't know how many girls were actually there, but when Sexy Star went in there, and she overcame the odds, and she beat a guy... And they cut to the crowd, and there's a whole bunch of girls, and they're all cheering and clapping, and they're all happy and proud of the girl. I thought, great. That was cool and fun. It was fun. Main event was King Cuerno versus Drago in the last Luchador standing match. We've all seen Randy Orton do the draping DDT. Drago here had a draping brain buster. He lifted the dude up like a suplex. He laid his feet on the rope, he paused briefly, and then dropped him right on his head. And it looked fucking cool. So let's talk about Stryker. (laughs) Ah, must we? Cuerno lays out Drago with a powerbomb on the floor. Matt Stryker calls it a bubba bomb. Yeah. Now, if this had been 
That full Nelson Nass Buster that only I've ever seen Bubba Ray use, that would have been one thing. This is just a power bomb. And he called it a Bubba bomb like Bubba Ray Dudley had invented the power bomb. That's right. So Querno hits his big tope. Stryker calls it a tope con hilo, which it wasn't because that's a flip. It's just a big dive. Just screwing names up left and right and making it all more complicated than it has to be. That's the big thing. If he just said a big dive would have been fine, but he tried to get specific, and in trying to get specific, he screwed it all up. So, these just went back and forth the whole time. I like where Cuerno rammed Drago's head into the ring post four times <laughs> in a row, laid him on a table, and then went up top, and Drago popped up and knocked him off the ropes. Good thing that ring post is so soft and gentle. So, uh... Actually, it wasn't even the finish, but Cuerno hit a fireman's carry Michinoku driver off the apron through a table. This table broke instantly and broke their fall about 0%. That looked like it sucked. And finally, they were in the ring, and Cuerno laid Drago out in the corner, grabbed a rope, and tied him up, and it was last man standing, and so he won. And that was it. I got uh, mixed feelings about this. We had somebody who called us on uh, Observer Live today. And big fan of, of Lucha Underground, but he, he noted that a last man standing match is not exactly the kind of match that's going to translate well to high-flying, fast-paced Lucha Libre. You're used to guys doing all these dives, getting up, doing all these crazy moves, getting up. This was like, hit a move, and you're both down, and the ref awkwardly starts to count to 10. And all that said, they still managed to turn it into a pretty good match. I... Didn't like the finish because it was too WWE. If you're going to do a last man standing match, one dude should just beat the shit out of the other guy till that guy can't stand up in 10 seconds. When you tie the guy to the ropes, what that is is, well, we really didn't want to hurt the guy, so we tied him or we put him under something. That's what WWE always does. Oh, Kane's going to lose? We'll put him under a giant box. That way he can't get out. It, it's a, it's a cop-out finish. And if you don't want to, if you don't want to beat either guy, don't put them together in the match. And he ties him to the ropes, and the guy can't get out because he's tied to the ropes. And after essentially, it is anything goes, but you tied the guy to the fucking ropes to win this match. Matt Stryker's like, well, it looks like this feud is finished. And I'm like, if I were the motherfucker that got tied to the ropes, this feud ain't finished. I'm gonna kill this dude. What? That was a conclusion that Stryker came to, so I didn't like the finish, but it was all right. Again, a very good show, but not the best Lucha Underground I've ever seen. No, both shows were pretty disappointing tonight. That's right. But what the hell can you do? You can't win them all. You can't. It's 52 weeks a year. Yep. Yeah. Not all going to be winners. They're not all going to be winners. Let's do uh, one last song here. and. Then